Professor Koger for your provocative uh, presentation. Um, before coming to this forum, I um, have a chance to speak to um, Ajahn Titinan before, and he said we don't know uh, what Professor Koko is going to say um, on this special lecture, and I was curious um, how provocative he can be. Now, um, listening to his presentation, I, um, I have no doubt that it's very provocative to some who might think um, who might be very positive um, that thinking war is not possible in this era. So um, I know that some of you may have a lot of questions and comments on his special lecture, but hold on to that. We come, uh, we'll come back to that after the end of the panel discussion that we're going to have. So let me introduce um, our speakers uh, today. Uh, to start with, I have um, Kun Gawi Jongkit Tawon. He is a col columnist um, of the nation, and also um, he contributes to the vernacular language Nation Sutsabda and Komshat Lut Daily. And also, he is the host of Insights Asia Current Affairs program. Um, next, we have um, Ambassador Robert Fitz, uh, who is the director of the American Studies program in ISIS since 2008. Um, and he served as a UN ambassador to Papua New Guinea um, as a charge of UN um, and as charge of the US Embassy in Manila. In Washington, he served as policy assignment covering Southeast Asia and works as um, legislative assistance for defense and foreign affairs for then the Senator um, George Michel. In his final assi um, assignment of, for the State Department, he worked with the U.S. ASEAN Business Council um, assessing U.S. relations with ASEAN. And last but not least, our famous um, Ajahn Titinan Pung Sutilak, um, who is the director of ISIS, and I know that uh, all of you know him well. So let's start with uh, Kun Kavi. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman. Uh, I have to remind you, I have changed my topic. Uh, I will speak how to fight uh, or to go to war with China from ASEAN perspective. So <laughs> after listening to Professor Crocker, I really uh, uh, realized that we are living in a much dreamy world in this part of the world. So let me remind you we are talking about uh, South China Sea controversy is not yet war and uh, I will discuss about the role of ASEAN a little bit on China's and United States. I think Coca has, uh, uh, Coca has provided a very good uh, hypothesis and uh, much hard-hitting uh, provocative uh, uh, thesis uh, which uh, raise a lot of questions also in my mind which uh, the presentation I'm going uh, to make. I will look at the, the three issues that uh, impact on the, uh, on the overall uh, situation on around the South China Sea. Um, I will start off with a time frame on uh, so-called before and after the so-called uh, Phnom Penh incidents in July uh, 2012 on three specific areas. I will discuss on the ASEAN unity as a whole. The second uh, issue I will discuss is uh, ASEAN relations with the major power dialogues uh, surrounding the South China Sea. And then, uh, uh, if time permit, I will discuss um, ASEAN standing on global issue, which also very interesting because ASEAN uh, has been divided not only on South China Sea, but on many other issues. Of late was the issue related to the price of Rohingyas in the Rakhine state. And, uh, and then I, I would also examine uh, ASEAN position on South China Sea because the nuances and the body of politics that occur. Some probably some of you have read some of these uh, leaked documents that published widely uh, in the academic and the media world. But and it will talk from the perspective uh, from uh, myself as a journalist who has followed uh, the developments uh, for quite some time. So on the first issue, uh, the time frame before the uh, Phnom Penh incident, I have to uh, bring you back to 1995. That was the first time ASEAN and China relation uh, uh, enter uh, what I would describe as a realistic uh, 
uh, Abraham because of the dispute in the mischief reef. You have to remember that was the first time in March in 1995, ASEAN was able to issue a statement express serious concern over the South China Sea. And that was the first, and I would, I would contend that that would be the last time that ASEAN could muster and gather the guts, the courage to come up with one common position against uh, uh, China. The point here was ASEAN at that time was unified. It was only six core countries. That was a few months before uh, Vietnam joined uh, ASEAN in 1995. And uh, uh, Brunei joined, of course, in 1984. Uh, that was very smooth, no problem at all. And uh, the most amazing thing that the Philippines was able, the Philippines today has been nagging the lack of ASEAN's uh, uh, support. You know, Manila complained all the time. Unlike in 1995, uh, Philippines was really uh, happy and. Uh, there was one also one incident that people uh, have to uh, understand. The relation with the ASEAN in 1995 was good. Singapore at first was reluctant to support um, uh, Philippines on South China Sea, but later on because there was a, a bilateral incident about a maid who was about to execute that also encouraged to men's defense between Singapore and the Philippines. And this kind of uh, bilateral relation between ASEAN also dictate the overall uh, relation and position on the bigger issue on South China Sea. And that will probably give you a precursor why Cambodia uh, stood out, why Vietnam stood out, why certain countries stood out in its relation to the broader issue. Now, my second point, uh, uh, that's before the so-called um, Phnom Penh incident. Major powers relation with ASEAN at the time was very benign, was very quieted. They are very content to come to ASEAN meeting, not taken seriously. ASEAN is a top job. You can conduct corridor meeting with them. Great. United States came, missing, you know. You, you will see that when United States become very active, they attend all ASEAN meeting and make use of it. And in fact, uh, uh, Professor Coker made a very good uh, uh, remark, when 60% concentration of truth is moving to the Pacific, you expect action. Whenever you have places where you see concentration of US truth, you always see the inevitable war. You look at Iran, you look at Afghanistan now, you have to show that in the next years uh, there will be concentration of here, uh, in this uh, Asia Pacific. So it's a good uh, homework for us to how to think how we can manage this situation. But back in uh, before the uh, Phnom Penh incidents, uh, you have all the major powers uh, that engage with, with ASEAN. Uh, there was no problem. ASEAN. Uh, took things for granted, we are the driving force, ASEAN centrality was a given. So that kind of situation, no more, because I think um, the situation has changed. I, uh, I was, uh, as a journalist at the time, ASEAN always complained that United, United States uh, failed to give importance to ASEAN meeting, Condi Rice uh, did not attend ASEAN meeting uh, twice, and worst of all, Condi Rice refused to play piano for ASEAN minister, you know, you know, because normally in the post ministerial meetings, uh, senior dialogue partner will have a session where you come out, sing the song, loosening up, uh, singing songs. I even had uh, seen the Mandarin Outbreak, you know, uh, sing Don't Cry For Me, Argentina, or Colin Powell's uh, sings. Uh, uh, village uh, YMCA, so that sort of thing. So that was the kind. No more. Okay. Now, the third point is before the Phnom Penh incident, where ASEAN did not come up with a joint uh, uh, communicate. South China Sea was a topic that ASEAN and China could discuss. It was supposed to be bilateral. There's no internationalization. We talked for a period of since uh, 1995 to the year 2000, 
10, 15 years of honeymoon period, which ASEAN and China have relatively laid back discussion. That is why there was no progress, tangible progress, so much so that uh, you have to look back. And if you have to blame uh, any person, you have to blame the whole uh, structure, the whole dialogue process that have been taken for so long without uh, making substantive progress uh, during the time, the 15 year. Uh, certain times they were close, but then again uh, because of the of the changing landscape. Now everything's uh, changed. Once the uh, China uh, joined the WTO, I remember the first time uh, China join ASEAN Regional Forum, everybody was thinking that China would be contained by this new region-wide uh, uh, regional forum. But within years, it was the China that contained AIF. Now China's taking the lead within the AIF. And mind you, uh, the last session of ASEAN Regional Forum in Phnom Penh, the plenary session lasts only eight minutes talking about this uh, most important uh, regional-wide security forum. Now the situation has completely changed. After the Phnom Penh incidents, the, you have seen that first, ASEAN no longer has a kind of uh, unity that we always talk about. ASEAN centrality is at risk because uh, you have a situation where uh, ASEAN member is willing to contest the so-called common interest, common objective of being ASEAN. That has never happened before in the past 45 years. At least uh, they come up with a joint communique. Uh, cynically, I think that was deployed by Cambodia to encourage journalists to read joint communique. You know, because nobody pay attention to joint communique because normally joint communique at the end of ASEAN meeting, uh, they will be paid ahead of time two months uh, ahead of time, you know, with uh, 130 paragraph, at least uh, 12,000 words, you know, very boring. Uh, as a journalist covering uh, ASEAN meeting, there were time that you have to read every word it's about the Vietnamese troop withdrawal, pulled out, partial pull out, and now, uh, from now on, uh, joint communicate will be the main document that you have to read and the paragraph on South China Sea will be the main focus. So the situation is this, ASEAN is no longer uh, united because each, unlike in 1995, can really speak uh, uh, or in one voice now because uh, at the moment each ASEAN nation has a developed close relation uh, each individual country has developed a very special life relation, Thailand with China, Cambodia with China, uh, you have of course uh, other country. That has happened and created a dilemma and I don't think ASEAN will be able again to come up with a common statement like they did in March 1995. So it was not a surprise at all that uh, the latest uh, six principle statement by ASEAN country was the uh, repetitions of the old uh, position. That was the best they can do. What happened now is one issue that's giving rise to, to ASEAN is that the role of the rotational chair. It has never become a problem. There's no division in ASEAN Charter or in any of ASEAN protocol that uh, uh, remind the chair that the, its important task is to make sure that you have a con consensus and come up with joint communique. And in this sense, I think Cambodia has uh, broken the rule. It just uh, uh, failed uh, ASEAN because ASEAN now has a huge dilemma without JC. I think the future ASEAN meeting, especially ASEAN summit, uh, is at least and uh, there is a possibility that uh, the name of the new Secretary General to replace Sureen uh, would not be announced in time because all the decisions, there are over a do two dozen decisions made apart from the controversy over South China Sea. You have decisions made on many other things on ASEAN functional cooperation, decisions to establish uh, ASEAN Institute of Peace and Reconciliation, the decisions whether to release the gist or the text of the uh, ASEAN Declaration of Human Rights. 
so there are many other things, including the uh, proposed name of the new Secretary General of ASEAN, uh, Vietnamese uh, diplomat Le Le Min. So these are the things that uh, came into trouble. So I think uh, the role of chair has become important. Now there's some informal discussion whether there should be a guideline try to make sure that this thing will not come back again or repeat itself, particularly uh, when you have a senior leader who has been running uh, Southeast Asian politics for so long, like Prime Minister Hun Sen. So one big question remains uh, uh, for us to think about is this. Uh, uh, what ASEAN is going to say, what the Chinese leader is going to say on the ASEAN Chinese summit statement on the 10th anniversary of the DOC. So I think this this is a, a huge uh, problem because now uh, both Cambodia and all ASEAN countries admit that they will not be able to finish uh, the uh, DOC in time. At the beginning of the Cambodian chair, Cambodia came all out with very uh, big statement that uh, it wants to highlight the year, this year, when Cambodian chair, the ASEAN uh, chair, the, the best thing has happened in the 45th year's anniversary of uh, ASEAN, as it's turned out, as you can see, it has been quite a disaster in the making, and I think that was the uh, opposite ideas that uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen or Ho Nam Ho uh, has. So this new strategic landscape has uh, forced ASEAN into a new mode and I think now a lot of discussion uh, has been going on how ASEAN can uh, handle the so-called major power involvement. No more, no more. ASEAN now is a falcon. Um, the Vietnamese uh, senior official now described that ASEAN is no longer serve as a fulcrum or a venue for major power. He decided to call ASEAN that ASEAN must behave like an airport controlling tower. This is the Vietnamese word. So you will see ASEAN performing the role of controlling tower that in the future ASEAN must be able to decide which major power land at what time, land at which specific uh, location. Whether ASEAN will do, will be able to do this or not, it depends on ASEAN's uh, uh, solidarity, centrality, which of course, uh, at least. I, for me, you know, uh, people in this region, when they look at China-US relation, uh, I must admit, uh, I never in, uh, engage myself in the kind of scenario that Professor uh, Coker outlined. I mean, uh, outline. You really uh, 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 give me a really a big wake up call when you look at the potential of uh, Sino uh, US conflict. For me, uh, looking from uh, the region, even though mutual mistrust between US and China uh, deepened by the day, uh, between the world's biggest and second uh, biggest economy. But I don't think converse, confrontation or the war, as described by Professor Coca, uh, would become a reality. Certainly because uh, in this part of the world, we believe that US-China are uh, actually working together uh, at the highest level because of their growing uh, economic uh, uh, mutuals uh, dependent on each, each other. But of course, there is a one caveat because the uh, increased mutual understanding and cooperation between the U.S. and China, of course, is there. But there will never be uh, some sort of uh, same mind or the same kind of uh, U.S. wanted China's to behave as part of the international uh, uh, stakeholder responsible. This message being given because China and U.S. essentially have uh, different values, norm, and standards. So. There will never be a collision of willing in that sense. So I think ASEAN is very happy because ASEAN fear that US and China will collude and you know uh, they will be victimized. So given all this situation, South China Sea has been mentioned, then you have Korean pen Peninsula, Taiwan Strait of late has never been uh, discussed much because uh, with uh, uh, Taiwan President uh, Ma Yingzhou uh, in, in the position, I think they were uh, less likely of the war over the, uh, the, the strait. Now, um, 
So what would be the ASEAN uh, uh, ways to engage the, these two ma major powers? I think uh, ASEAN member, all of them, uh, to a certain degree, of course, welcome U.S. return and strengthen present as been discussed previous to, to Asia, which later become rebalancing, strengthening alliance uh, with the Philippines, and of course you see Japan, Australia, the only alliance that has been left in the boondock is still Thai-US alliance, which has been outside the radars for quite some time, and I think it will remain so in the foreseeable future, at least in the next year and a half. We will see whether uh, whoever the president will come uh, stop over in Thailand for one hour or not on their way on their way back to Cambodia for the East Asia summit and I, I think uh, as you can see ASEAN won a win-win situation not choosing side but in this situation as I described pre uh, Phnom Penh incident and now certain time you cannot the situation rise up you have to make a decision and certain country has to do so and it's inevitable so in, in this sense, I think one of the uh, way that uh, uh, ASEAN should engage is uh, to make sure that U.S. is fully engaged in the rise uh, new uh, so-called regional architecture, whether it's in e uh, ARF or uh, East Asia Summit. So, and also make sure that ASEAN also engage other power, for example, uh, one always mentioned U.S., uh, China, but that is not sufficient. You also have uh, uh, India, you also have Russia, and of course, when ASEAN talk about major power, they always refer to ASEAN plus three, plus three, plus three, plus two. That's the uh, East Asia. And I think Russia, you have to mention Russia because Russia uh, is coming back. It's also identifying uh, itself as a Pacific power and with Putin is feel much closer with Southeast Asia after all at one time during the Cold War it was uh, Russia dominance of uh, former Indo-Chinese country so another way that ASEAN should engage is to to, to make sure that uh, uh, it can enforce the so-called regional code of conduct and so-called all the existing security frameworks uh, I don't want to bore you, you have uh, Treaty of Amity, uh, corporations, you have SOFAN, which have long been forgotten, the Philippine races, I was so surprised, and then you have the OC and Chon Face, which of course suffer a big blow when the uh, America, UK and France refused to, uh, to sign the protocol at the last minute. So in the end, here is the ASEAN exit strategy of all this. The, uh, ASEAN must as I said, uh, expand the common view and position on political and security issue, which is not easy. Uh, if you are the student of uh, ASEAN politics, you will know that in the past 45 years, ASEAN have two common uh, positions that they identify with. One issue was the problem of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where ASEAN adopt one common position because uh, ASEAN has nothing to do with the situation. And the second issue that ASEAN always has a common position since 1988, that was the Palestinian uh, issue. Even when it comes to uh, the main decision, ASEAN is still divided. Thailand, uh, Singapore, and Myanmar are delayed the actions and finally uh, agree. That caused a lot of frictions between uh, ASEAN and Gulf state. So, um, the other thing is now ASEAN as it's preparing for the integration uh, in the year 2015, uh, which only 840 days away, if you start to count down, uh, there is a uh, huge uh, urgent uh, demands for ASEAN to get closer to breach the security gap. And South China Sea is a big test. And then as you can see, so far, ASEAN has failed. And ASEAN also has failed on other issues. For example, on the issue of Rohingya. Two weeks ago, ASEAN called for a special meeting on Rohingya, and it fell flat on the floor. Uh, uh, ASEAN could not come out with a consensus. OIC played a bigger role on ASEAN matter on this point. And 
The second point is the asset must increase consultation among leaders, and this is the problem because you don't have leaders that stay long time in ASEAN politics, unlike the first 30 years you have LKY, Mahathir Mohamed, uh, Suharto, now you have uh, Hun Sen that dominated uh, the floor. You have new leader, new body politics, you know, you have uh, presidents. Uh, uh, Noi Noi Aquino in the meetings who could not attend the whole session. Um, and then, to, as I said earlier, it's very important to strengthen uh, regional architecture, both economics and security. And finally, uh, I think it's also very important for ASEAN to fly ASEAN flag whenever it's possible because uh, uh, except on the ASEAN day, but uh, well, as flying ASEAN flag means uh, ASEAN must come together on issue. For example, there's one area that ASEAN has failed to carry ASEAN flag, that's in the areas of peacekeeping. All ASEAN members are very active in peacekeeping at one time or another. Thailand, in uh, Somalia, in uh, Burundi, and now in Southern Sudan. You have even Burma in the early 60s and all that. So putting together uh, on peacekeeping uh, presented to the UN under ASEAN fact. But then again, ASEAN, because of its uh, uh, concerns and obsessive with the uh, sovereignties and uh, Sarkozy's security view, they have not yet uh, done so. So that's uh, the gist of my presentation. Now, lastly, uh, just to give you the body politics of what's going on within ASEAN, this is for my own uh, uh, discussions uh, with countries uh, that uh, evolve in the South China Sea, both Clemens and Nan Clemens. As you can see, uh, within ASEAN, you can divide safely into four groups. The non Clemens uh, have two groups. The Clemens also have two groups. The non Clemens, you have the hard lines and the soft line, which is similar to the, to, to the other group. Um, among the, uh, you, you, I, I will draw uh, from all these examples I will give you. Uh, the first uh, is uh, Cambodia. Cambodia is, of course, the non Clemens that is the uh, has the most hardcore, that means uh, did not want any mentioning of specific incident or violation and, and contending this is a bilateral issue and uh, no compromise, any compromise solution. And then you have uh, Myanmar. Myanmar actually, very few people know, openly support Cambodia. The body politics kept us, uh, is some leader uh, attend the working draft of the joint com communique and support the Cambodian position. This is very interesting because if you see uh, the overall body politics, uh, Myanmar just reject the Cambodian call for ASEAN foreign uh, minister meeting on Rohingya. Now, uh, Laos. So you can ca uh, categorize Laos on the, on the uh, non clement but on the uh, Cambodian side, but which softest tone. Laos also support Cambodia quietly. You won't read that in, in the newspaper. Laos wants to see consensus. Failing consensus, Laos will support the chair. That is Cambodia. Now the trickiest is Thailand, of course, which you expect. Uh, we have no bone, we have no spine. Thailand, of course, as the chair of the uh, coordinator uh, of uh, ASEAN and China, we did not show any clear. I emphasize again no clear position as except looking well forward to coordinating ASEAN China uh, dialogue uh, Thailand did not support Vietnam position or Philippine position number fifth this is also interesting now we focus on the claimant you have Brunei Brunei has been very quiet uh, Brunei actually if you talk to the person those who attend the meeting will uh, realize that uh, Brunei actually was very soft, did not support uh, Philippines or Vietnam. And I think uh, strange is that uh, Brunei is one of the claimant and just appeal for the call. I think Brunei was very clever because it was prepared for the next year's share. It did not want to see this issue occur and continue drag on to its chair next year, which is the next uh, four months. And just for record, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Prin Bogia uh, left.
for the United, uh, United Kingdom to, to attend one of his daughter's graduation during the meeting. That's how important it was. Um, uh, Indonesia, non claimant but Indonesia, pivotal role must be noted here. Because uh, Indonesia played very active. It should be Thailand as the coordinator, but being Thai, being this government which uh, speak no English, uh, it's very difficult. Um, uh, so Indonesia tried, failed to come out with a compromise text to take into account all both sides. Indonesia thought that it could have done so, working very hard, but uh, he didn't realize that Honomong was in the sense that no patient disconnected. And I think that's the toll ASEAN has to play for adding new member without any preparation. Uh, Malaysia, Malaysia body politics show sympathy toward the Philippines and Vietnam as one of the claimant, but uh, support Indonesia to find a compromise. Vietnam certainly uh, to it, uh, is the number one uh, strong position on the uh, EEZ and the continental shelf, but uh, did not really you know, come out differently uh, from Cambodia, even though given their fraternal relation. Uh, and in in, indeed, if one reads all these uh, leaked documents, you will see that Vice Foreign Mis Minister Vietnam, uh, Wan Bin, Pham Bin, uh, even uh, call Hon Nam Hong Braff, you know, said that uh, there was uh, no agreements on the incidents on the, uh, no JC. Uh, that's the point. So finally, the Philippines, which has become the main uh, culprit in the eye, of course, uh, in the eyes of uh, Cambodia. So you have seen that these four groups uh, will interplay in the next few months, whether it will be able to come and form the lowest denominator that represent the weakest ASEAN against China's or not. And I hope that uh, China and the ASEAN would be able to agree on the fixed date to working on the, the DOC because that's the only instrument that will reduce the tension without this. Uh, it would endanger the whole region and that will make uh, Professor Crocker's uh, thesis become a reality. And to do that, uh, both sides now realize that as the way it is now, it's a no-win. It's a lose-lose uh, uh, position. I think the best way is to ensure that uh, all sides step back a little bit now. I think there's a second, third thoughts that are coming back, more realistic, uh, relied on the international instruments, talk less on the historical claim. We hope that would be the language uh, that will induce both parts to sit in and uh, work on the DOC. Work on DOC, it will take another 10 years. We don't care. At least it's dragged on so that to ensure that there's some dialogue between the two. At least, you know, ASEAN has uh, spent the last 10 years to uh, work on the guidelines. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Ah, it is coming on. Uh, it's always difficult to follow a couple of distinguished speakers because they inevitably will have covered some of the ground I wanted to cover. Uh, and so I may, I've been drawing arrows on my notes to skip around, so I may be a little disorganized, but in order to give you the impression that I'm actually organized, I have a few slides, none of which are extraordinarily informative. They just illustrate. Uh, I'm tasked with giving the U.S. point of view on the South China Sea, uh, and this is what I will try to do, but I am, I would normally be somewhat critical of some of U.S. policies, uh, but perhaps I'll hold that to the end. But first, if you're going to understand the U.S. point of view, I think it's very important that we also understand the Chinese point of view, because that's what's playing out here. And so, rather than the rise of China, which I hear incessantly, I think it's better to think of the resumption of China, of think as the Chinese do, resumption of China to its proper role in the world. After all, as Professor Coker said, for 600 years or so, they were a preeminent power, certainly in Asia and generally in the world, and only for the last 150 years did they recede somewhat. So I think if you're going to judge their motivations and judge what they're trying to do, it's better to see it as they do. 
I'm also glad that Professor Coker uh, pointed out after disparaging America's ability to have a strategy, coherent strategy, that the U.S. is trying to manage and work with China and not contain it. That is the strategy. Uh, you, if you listen to the U.S., particularly during an election season, there's all sorts of crazy things are said. They do not necessarily represent U.S. policy. They do not necessarily represent reality. As I came in this morning, I read a uh, a statement by one of our politicians, Michelle Bachman, you may have heard of her, uh, who was railing against President Obama, pointing out that he can't possibly understand what a normal American feels because he's rich. Uh, and the disconnection with her preferred candidate, who was immensely rich, and President Obama, who grew up quite poor and has made a few million dollars, I guess, selling his books, is rampant, but she chooses not to see that. There's lots of statements you will see on foreign policy coming out from various wing nuts uh, in, on both sides of uh, the U.S. political spectrum, but don't take them seriously. The serious foreign policy managers, thinkers, are thinking of ways to work with China to bring China into the international uh, system smoothly. And I've never heard any really serious person other than some neocon politicians ever refer to containment of China ever since 2002. Um, I think one of perhaps the American, in order to convey the American point of view through the American, uh, American eyes, it's important to understand how much Americans worry about rules rather than just we will work things out. There has to be some type of agreed rule system. Last year, there was a very interesting U.S.-Chinese uh, gathering. The Chinese Olympic team visited the United States for a series of three exhibition basketball games uh, with the Duke University team, which was one of the really powerful teams. I'm not a real basketball fan, but everyone is, most people are basketball fans in U.S. politics now since the president's a basketball fan. Um, there was a problem with the rules in the NCAA, the U.S. collegiate uh, basketball system. You have 35 seconds when you get the ball, then you have to take a shot. In the Chinese uh, league, as I understand it, you have 24 seconds. So for these games, they agreed to go with the 24 second rule. The games played out very well, um, and they showed that Duke University indeed has long been an extraordinarily powerful basketball team, and they won all three games, but that also showed a surprising amount of talent coming up out of China. And this was all demonstrated by the two teams working by agreed rules. Now, um, if we're going to understand what the U.S. sees as going on in the South China Sea, I'd like to uh, move a little way away from uh, the South China Sea, We're move up north, because if you call people in Washington this week, no one's, very few people are paying attention to the convention, that's just a set show. You call the foreign policy people, they're worried about uh, some disputes in, in the north, uh, the East China Sea it's called. Uh, last week, uh, the South Korean uh, President Bak visited what the South Korea calls the Dokdo Islands, which the Japanese call Takashima. And uh, the South Korea administers those islands, but the Japanese have a, a long-term claim on those islands, and it's a matter of real political friction. Uh, Japan sent a letter of protest to the South Korean government. South Korean South Korea returned the letter without even opening it. It sounds like a bunch of schoolboys, but there's a lot of emotions caught up in these. Also, in the last couple of weeks, Chinese um, activists visited the Daiyu Islands, which the uh, Japanese call Senkaku, and the Japanese can, do have a presence on most of the islands. And and Russia sent uh, a uh, they announced some ships are coming to the. Uh, Kuril Islands, which are administered by Russia but claimed by Japan. Now, th this this slide just shows one of the Chinese boats actually being blocked by some Japanese coast coast guards. Um, and these these movements aren't just a restatement or uh, you know, resurfacing of World War II grievances. Um, they're, I would say, largely an attempt by the various governments 
to offset social and economic and political instability at home, to strengthen the governments. It's a political maneuver. Uh, if you look at what's happening in all of in these three countries, China's going through a once in a, trans, a decade transition of leadership. South Korea is moving to a presidential election. Uh, Japan has a lot of uncertainty, but one certainty is the prime minister will be resigning resigning sometime shortly. So, these were none of these politicians could in this uncertain time, indeed in any time, give in on sovereignty, and they could actually bolster their nationalist credentials by stirring stirring the pot a bit. And that's what is happening in the North China Sea. I think if you, when we go down to the South China Sea, you've all seen these maps that shows how the uh, the claims overlap. It's fairly, fairly indistinct, I guess, in this slide, but you're all aware of that. The actual islands, the features, and to use UN uh, Convention Law of the Sea terms, uh, don't mean very much in the South China Sea. Unlike one of, well, at least one of the islands in the North, in the East China Sea we just discussed, um, there's really no strategic value in any of these with the exception of the parcels, uh, which are both close to the Vietnamese coast and close to the Chinese island of Hainan and could uh, be a, uh, a strategic asset or liability depending on how the uh, how tension might reassert itself and indeed that's the only place where conflict real military conflict twice between Vietnam and China has transpired uh, so what's going on now is as we said the return of China after 150 years of weakness it can now project its strength into the South China Sea and indeed it sees the South China Sea I believe, uh, much like the U.S. sees um, the Caribbean as an extension of its territory. Also, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and the Philippines are consolidating as nations. Uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, and Singapore are beginning to uh, put some of their money into navies, uh, as is, of course, China. So, as Professor Coker said, there is a bit of a arms race, perhaps, going on. As in the East China Sea, uh, nationalism is a potent force in Southeast Asia and in China. Uh, I would say in moderation, nationalism is a civic virtue. But it also, nationalism is a state policy can turn into a cancer and uh, can be fatal if taken too far. Uh, in the North, politicians, as we noted, on, in many countries are stirring these claims not for real strategic purposes, but for domestic political purposes. Uh, that's also part of what's happening uh, in the South. And for Thai, I think, as you could, if you reflect on your own uh, disagreement with Cambodia over at Prawe Han, um, that neither government on either side could be seen to be giving in uh, on, on claims and thus you have to somehow proceed a different way if you're not going to uh, proceed to violence. Now, uh, U.S. has a series of interests in the South China Sea. In 2010, in Hanoi, at the ARF meeting, uh, the uh, Secretary of State of the United States uh, voiced U.S. concern for peaceful resolution of the problems in the South China Sea. And the Chinese foreign minister rejoined with a series of questions, essentially doubting the U.S. had any interest in the South China Sea. Uh, but since then, uh, in a number of speeches by President Obama, Secretary, President Obama, Secretary Clinton, and Defense Secretary Gates at the time, uh, have underlined U.S. interests in uh, the South China Sea. I, I can distill these down to four. Uh, I won't try to make it too complex. One is respect for international law. As I said in the beginning, this is fundamental to the U.S. view of how you have an orderly international system which doesn't break down as it has from time to time. Uh, customary law for the, is underlying uh, the law, the laws that uh, take the, the rule on the sea. Originally, it was a three-mile territorial sea for the very practical reason that that's how far you could fire a cannon. Uh, later on, as sophisticated as after the Napoleonic Wars, 
as artillery grew more uh, sophisticated, the convention uh, uh, hardened on 12 miles as a territorial sea, which a nation could control uh, the same way it could control its own territory. Now, the UN uh, Convention of Law of the Sea introduced the concept of an exclusive economic zone um, and would allow a nation to, uh, to control uh, economic activity, the prospecting for natural resources, fisheries and whatnot within this exclusive economic zone. But the vast but other nations would be allowed to continue to conduct non-economic activity uh, within the law of the sea. Now this is, as with all international conventions, it's still being interpreted. Uh, most countries abide by this view, the vast majority do. China and Malaysia uh, are two local uh, exceptions who claim the right to restrict military activities in the exclusive economic zone. For the U.S., uh, it's a bit embarrassing, frankly, to represent the U.S. overseas as I did for a while. The U.S. has not signed the, the Convention of Law of the Sea. This is for domestic political reasons. Uh, every president uh, since President Clinton has strongly su supported, uh, the, strongly advocated the U.S. should sign the Law of the Sea. Um, president Bush made a special push for this. Uh, uh, Brent, there were just hearings four months ago where the Obama administration again tried to get the U.S. to accede to Law of the Sea, uh, and both Secretary Panetta, I guess it was at the time, and Secretary Clinton testified strongly and brought up the case of the South China Sea, saying if the U.S. is going to uh, argue legal cases in uh, in international maritime disputes, we should be a, par a, a formal party to the Claw of the Sea. This has block, been blocked by, a num by several U.S. Republican senators who think it would be a loss of US, with U.S. sovereignty. But be that as it may, ever since President Clinton, uh, the U.S. presidents, the U.S. administrations have treated the, the provisions of the law of the sea as the same as customary law and have directed that the U.S. military abide by the provisions of the law of the sea. Now, there are other, many other, which I can't go into, laws, international conventions, international practices that dictate uh, how one acts, conducts oneself on the high seas. There's something, um, it's coal regs, and I don't know if that's the abbreviation, but it's avoidance of collisions at sea. And this has been a international convention, I think it came in the 1800s, virtually everyone's a member of it, and it says that every nation must enforce on its flagged vessels um, the, uh, these rules that say you avoid s serious collisions and incidents of the high seas. Um, one rule, one real concern of the United States is Chinese vessels have on a number of occasions ignored this, um, this convention. The, in the U.S. you're tried in civil court if your if your ship hits another ship, and if you're found that you 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 are in the wrong, I'm not sure how it goes. It depends on who's steaming in what direction. Uh, you you suffer civil penalties and go to jail. And uh, but China, in three occasions, let's see, in 2009, a U.S. Uh, naval ship uh, was surrounded by five. Chinese uh, fishing vessels who the, the Navy ship was able to stop just in time, but there almost was a collision that would have sunk one of the vessels. Uh, in 2010, Chinese fishing boats rammed a, a Japanese Coast Guard vessel. 2011, a China ves Chinese vessel cut the underwater rig of a Vietnamese survey ship in, what, in waters that Viet Vietnam considers to be its own and China considers to be its own. But these violations of very old and long practiced, uh, long accepted rules of the road to sea really do profoundly disturb the United States. And that's as the United States worries about a deterioration of this. The United States is also very interested in freedom of navigation. Um, the uh, foreign uh, minister of China in the Hanoi meeting 
uh, asserted that the U.S. had absolutely no interest in freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. Well, first, that's not true. This sketchy map we have up here shows the oil flows through um, the uh, South China Sea. And that's uh, those oil flows are say three, three times the amount of oil going through the Suez Canal, 15 times the amount of uh, petroleum that goes through the Panama Canal. The vast majority of the energy supplies for uh, US allies, China and Korea, but it's also for China, go through the South China Sea, as well as their normal commercial, most, much of China's normal commercial trade. This is a vital international waterway. The US has always been concerned with freedom of navigation. The first 50 years of uh, the US existence as a country, we went to war twice against countries which were interfering with freedom of navigation. Uh, once Professor Coker's country, uh, the War of 1812, and uh, then in the Mediterranean, uh, the famous shores of Tripoli, where the U.S. Marines went ashore because pirates were interfering with U.S. Uh, shipping. In uh, the U.S. entered World War I, largely due to violations of freedom of navigation, uh, and although there, was, there were other proximate causes, of course, for World War II. Uh, one of the first uh, nationwide speeches the, um, President Roosevelt gave after the entry to World War II was emphasizing the importance of freedom of uh, navigation on the seas, and that this was one of the fundamental reasons that we had to assert uh, uh, our military in World War I. And for South China Sea, uh, in 1961, the U.S. filed a protest uh, with the United Nations over the Philippines, asserting what the U.S. considered to be uh, a greater t territorial sea claim in the South China Sea than, uh, than was afforded by international and customary law. So the U.S. is very, and always has been, concerned with freedom of navigation and is concerned with uh, South China Sea. The U.S. Also, I won't speak about this too much, but is vitally concerned with security and stability in the so in Southeast Asia region. region uh, because there are many U.S. allies and trading partners here. Any deterioration uh, would have serious economic consequences for the United States and security consequences. And the U.S. has a fundamental interest all around the world in unimpeded commerce and economic development. China does as well. Uh, you know, China's becoming very active in Africa, uh, very active in investment in, in Latin America. Uh, you know, any major country has a fundamental interest in unimpeded uh, economic development and sea commerce. Uh, so, the, you know, the United States does have some serious interest in the South China Sea. Let's see, what do I have coming here? Um, all right, and. Um, in August 3, this is, this is just one of the very few inhabited islands. I believe there are 40 inhabited islands in the South China Sea. And if you can focus on the picture, you'll see it's, it's got a seawall and it's about uh, a, a meter above high tide and has a few houses. They're not very imposing. Um, in, uh, on August 3rd, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this month, China declared a prefecture, uh, a, gave it a higher administrative status uh, of uh, Sancha. This is a aerial picture with a couple notations on it of Sancha uh, and announced its uh, intention to station perhaps a couple thousand troops there. They're extending the runway so it can um, hold fighter jets, but more importantly that the, it would be the administrative center for, in theory, the entire South China Sea, all the features on it, several hundred islets and reefs, uh, which in the announcement, China pointed out that 40 of them are illegally occupied by other people. Uh, so these small features, this is by far the largest, and it's, half, it's sort of halfway between Hainan and Vietnam, would assert control over 3.5 million square kilometers. Uh, the United States um, issued a statement 
which I find fairly bland, said the United States has a national interest in the maintenance of peace and stability, respect for international law, freedom of navigation, and an unimpeded lawful commerce in the South China Sea. We do not take a position on competing territorial claims over land features, have no territorial ambitions. However, we believe the nations of the region should work collaboratively and diplomatically to resolve disputes without coercion, without intimidation, without threats, and without the use of force. China reacted very strongly um, and rejected the uh, U.S. assertion, called in U.S. diplomats, said, expressed its strong dissatisfaction and resolute opposition to the statement, which to me seemed fairly bland. Uh, now, China has long uh, thought that uh, you know thought that the U.S. actions are encouraging more aggressive approaches by fellow other claimants, particularly uh, the Philippines and Vietnam, and indeed. Uh, perhaps in a, uh, a mistake brought on by enthusiasm with, during a uh, visit to the Philippines, uh, President Clinton, excuse me, Secretary Clinton uh, used the phrase the West Philippine Sea, which is what the Philippines calls it, but perhaps that was impolitic. But um, it's important, and I think China realizes, and probably the reason that they, China reacted so strongly is the U.S. approach thus far has caused some at ease in some quarters, but it's broadly and quietly appreciated. Um, there's a perception uh, that at least governments here that share this perception with the United States, China's becoming steadily more strident and, and bullying, uh, more worrisome that the Chinese claims are somewhat unclear, although perhaps August 3rd sharpens them a bit. Uh, they, the China is now using some uh, law of the sea language rather than just baldly asserting we've always controlled this and therefore it's ours. Uh, but they and but they also continue to claim uh, most of the South China Sea except areas about averaging 22 kilometers from the coasts of other countries, um, and uh, th this is not. The, if you have a small feature without going into the law of the seas, a, an island has to be an island above water at high tide, uh, must be able to support population, must have a water supply, then it can be considered a feature for law of the sea exclusive economic zone. But the, um, the, the, the resolution committees, t if you have a tiny island 30 miles from a major, you have a tiny island of a couple acres, 30 miles from a 200 mile long coastline, they don't draw the line in the middle between the two. The, 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 the courts decide you know, what would be the fairest, and generally the line is much closer to the smaller feature. So even in, if you considered that all of these features fit the UN law of the sea uh, criteria, the lines would be nowhere near as extensive as uh, China's claiming. Um, this, oh, it's fairly hard to see, sorry. This was China's point of view uh, is, and it shows their claim looking down the coast from China. Uh, this was just to reiterate my point that China does see this sort of like the Caribbean, but I would like to point out that the U.S. is, in the Caribbean, the United States has it, it, its territorial and exclusive economic zone. Uh, waters are as defined by the UN law of the sea. There's a line halfway between the US and Cuba and extends out to the borders uh, of the United States, to the border of the United States with Mexico and all of the, all of the islands of various uh, nationalities in the Caribbean have their own exclusive economic zones. The US, although it considers it has a special uh, interest in the Caribbean, doesn't try to uh, interfere with economic activity in other people's zones, does not try, does not try to claim more fisheries. But it, it is important to understand the, uh, the, um, the Chinese point of view. Um, in my view, the claimant states in, in the South China Sea, ah, here's another one, do have some, uh, some reasons to worry. Just for one, these are the fishery zones as claimed by the various ASEAN states, and most of them beyond 
not just the states that claim uh, features, but the fishery areas are overlapped by China's claims on fishery areas. And this could become serious in, in the future as the Chinese fisheries uh, patrols become more, their vessels become more and more militarized and more assertive. Uh, but the U.S., in my view, is trying to take a more passive approach and not confront with China. For example, uh, and this is around the world, uh, you all know what's going on in Syria. It's a humanitarian tragedy. Uh, international action, uh, through the UN anyway, has been vetoed uh, four times anyway that I know of by China and Russia. Now the US has been very, very critical, uh, fairly so I think, of Russia, but has not mentioned China at all. I, I don't, I think the US is trying to uh, take a, a more passive and accommodative approach with China in taking into interest uh, taking you know other interest into account as the U.S. moves. Now, where will these events lead? Uh, I think uh, Professor Coker had an interesting uh, perspective on on how they, things could possibly go bad. I would just like to have a few. I would like to make a few uh, observations. The legal claims aren't going to be resolved through no negotiation. The issues are too complex, and no one is the political cost for any government admitting a, a change in sovereignty would be far too great. Um, to that matter, the ASEAN claimants, who not only have overlapping claims with China, but have overlapping claims with each other, have made no move whatsoever to resolve their claims against each other. I think the continued growth of Chinese Navy and air power all but guarantees increasing tension. Um, But, uh, I, and I would uh, point out at this, uh, at this point that, that there's an interesting headline which has come up that the U.S. is shifting 60% of its military assets to the uh, Pacific. It's an interesting headline, but as Ajahn Titinan and I uh, found out, we had a dinner with the Admiral commanding all our Navy in the, uh, in the Pacific, all the U.S. Navy. It really doesn't... It just means a change of a half a dozen ships. It's uh, it's a good headline, but it doesn't really change the current reality that much. In theory, right now it's 40% uh, of U.S. naval and air assets are in the Pacific. Uh, to make it to 60%, in theory, is going to take a number of years and isn't going to be that massive a change in, in forces. But I think the U.S. task now is to provide enough of a presence uh, so that China will have to weigh the diplomatic costs of being increasingly insert, assertive. But the U.S. also has to avoid being too provocative uh, and having too much of a presence, a presence so as to incite uh, increasingly aggressive action, as Professor Coker noted, and uh, anybody that uh, has... Uh, uh, studied uh, China knows is that there's a virulent uh, domestic nationalist constituency which could it can be stimulated by anything. Uh, in uh, 2001, uh, three months after uh, President uh, Bush took office, a J-8 fighter, that's all I could find, the only picture on the internet, uh, was they're trying to guide a U.S. Uh, electronic uh, spy plane, frankly, uh, 60 miles off the Chinese coast, trying to push it away. Got fairly aggressive, crashed into the plane, the J-8 pilot, uh, the plane crashed and the pilot died and the uh, U.S. plane ended up on Hainan Island for, for uh, for a for 20 days, I guess it was, and that was a an example of the kinds of things that can go wrong as forces are, uh, as individuals flying planes, driving boats get together that might not have been an incident that might not have had, you know wouldn't have been directed by the by the capital, but these can happen. Um, this in this case, it was the incident was diffused. By, despite uh, President Bush's rather bellicose rhetoric during the election about China, uh, they're very, very careful statements, ambiguous statements, and gradually the situation was diffused. In 2009, uh, the, when the impeccable was blocked by a number of Chinese uh, fishing vessels and almost was a very serious accident, uh, the U.S. sent in an Aegis cruiser and the Chinese missiles, uh, vessels went away. 
So uh, the, tinder, the tinder is somewhat dry. Uh, this is a Chinese uh, demonstration that it er erupted uh, over the Senkaku Islands uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, there's an awful lot of domestic presser, pressure in Thailand, uh, excuse me, <laughs> in China. Uh, and the U.S. has to be cognizant of that. Uh, Senator Webb, uh, Jim Webb, uh, some of you may know, is the outgoing chairman of the East Asia uh, Committee uh, for, and the Foreign Relations in the Senate. He wrote an editorial last week uh, saying that this gives you a good uh, Webb knows as much about Asia as anyone in the Senate does. He's a very responsible senator, uh, but he's also an American politician. And this gives you a, a, what, a, what a reasonable and informed viewpoint is. He says, history teaches us when unilateral acts of aggression go unanswered, the bad news does not get better with time. He was, in this editorial, is about Chinese assertiveness in, uh, in South China Sea. Now, being uh, worldly and somewhat diplomatic, he, the analogy he drew is to when the world did not react to Chinese aggression in China in 1931 and how this gradually developed into uh, World War II in the Pacific and how destructive it was. But still, he's saying that the a reasonable, sober U.S. politician is saying the U.S. has to take some kind of action to restrain. Um, now, and it, it's not just in the U.S., though, that, that some people are uh, understanding the, the needs for restraint. Chinese Foreign Minister Yang Jiechi, the same one who had questioned the U.S. interest in the South China Sea last week, was in Jakarta. And he ma made it a point, speaking about the South, South China Sea, saying that uh, maintaining peace is a shared responsibility. So as with the U.S. patrols along with a number of other countries, including China and Thailand, off the Somali coast, uh, you know, fr freedom of commerce has been enforced somewhat. I just read a note that it, the number of piracy incidents off there due to the joint cooperation is down uh, by down to one third what they were last year. So we you know, hope that uh, in the South China Sea, both sides will see their continued interests in, in freedom of commerce and freedom of navigation. Uh, the United States hopes that uh, China must realize they can't arbitrarily force their will on neighboring nations. Uh, and the U.S. leaders must, I think, understand that Southeast a no Southeast Asian nation wants to be forced to choose between the United States and China. To try to force them to do that would probably bring a, a uh, conclusion that the U.S. would not be comfortable with. Uh, with that said, uh, I'd like to uh, just just make one other uh, observation. Uh, there's a lot of rhetoric coming out of the Republican uh, campaigns right now, some of which uh, is focusing on China and uh, some of which sounds quite rough. Uh, last week, uh, I believe it was, uh, Romney said China is, uh, this is paraphrasing, it was much longer, but China's stealing our intellectual property, they're hacking into our computers, they're manipulating our currency, I will label China currency manipulator my first day in office. An editorial in uh, China Daily this Monday uh, said, uh, called Mr. Romney's policies in an updated manifestation of Cold War mentality that endorse, endorses the China threat theory and focuses on containing China's rise. He said his uh, Romney's policies, as stated on his campaign website, were worrying and more pugnacious than the approach of the Obama administration. Well, I'd just like to say, uh, for those of you that read newspapers, don't get alarmed. Uh, there's a long tradition in US politics of talking tough on the campaign trail, particularly on China. And then as they take office, uh, each administration has found that it's a much more complicated situation. Uh, President Clinton, in his initial primary campaign, in my view, was far more critical of China than, than Governor Romney is being right now. He very quickly, uh, as he uh, took office, understood, well, very quickly, within six months, that there were so many equities involved with China that, you had, that, that they had to be managed carefully and you couldn't just try and assert yourself and force, and force China to do something because they're not going to do it. As I mentioned, President Bush, uh, President uh, G George W. Bush, 
uh, he was also fairly fairly critical on the campaign trail. He spoke of China as our as our biggest strategic competitor. Within two months of being in office, he had a uh, U.S. Air Force plane on Hainan Island, and realized that there's far more. Uh, at stake here with China, uh, and not just military, but uh, our growing trade with China. Uh, our, um, our our trade with China is actually doubled and within the, is set to double within five years from uh, 2008. I think that's the only country that as President Obama, when he took office, said his his goal was to double our trade, our exports to every country we can. I think China is the only one where he probably will have succeeded. China is extraordinarily important to the United States, and this isn't just a military question. So every administration since Richard Nixon as an administration has worked with China, and if there is a Romney administration, I think uh, they will find very quickly they have to work with China as well. And with that, I will leave it.